All right, turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, to me, we come to one of the most glorious sections uh, of Scripture in the Bible. Uh, again, the rapture of the church. Paul calls this the blessed hope. Uh, Peter refers to this as the living hope. Jesus says this is how we, he's going to bring us home to be with him, uh, to the place he has prepared for us in glory. Uh, these verses that we'll look at tonight, uh, they've been a source of comfort and encouragement for millions of Christians for the last 2,000 years, and they're to bring comfort, they're, they're to bring hope, they're to bring strength, no matter what you're going through. Uh, the rapture is that event that will immediately remove all of God's people from planet Earth and will instantly uh, change us and give us our resurrection bodies that are immortal, that are incorruptible. The rapture is just uh, one of the events that makes up what the Bible calls the first resurrection. There's a few different stages of the first resurrection. We know Jesus is the first one to rise from the dead. He's called the firstborn of the dead. He is the first one to receive his eternal resurrection body. And the first resurrection is a resurrection unto everlasting life. Now, I say that because there's a, the Bible talks about a second resurrection, and that's a resurrection that none of us want to be a part of because it does not have a good outcome. In fact, that is a resurrection that the Bible refers to as a resurrection unto eternal death, which means separation from God for all of eternity. Jesus tells us that there'll, there'll be a resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto death. The second resurrection, again, is something that no one should ever want to be a part of. Uh, tragically, most people will experience the second resurrection unto eternal death. Why do I say that? Because look at this verse in Matthew 7, verse 13. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Uh, the very next verse, Jesus says, because narrow is the gate, difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it, because that gate is Jesus. He's the only way into everlasting life. The book of Revelation tells us what this resurrection will result in unto damnation. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So you need to make sure that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If it's not, you need to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, become your Lord and Savior, because without Jesus, it doesn't matter how good a person is, it doesn't matter how many good deeds you've done, without Jesus, you will end up in the lake of fire. Without Jesus, it doesn't matter how many you know, commandments you try to keep, you're just as lost as the most wretched of sinners. But praise the Lord, that is not <clears throat> what, the, uh, what we are going to be talking about tonight. Uh, this evening, we're looking at the rapture of the church. This is a, a glorious thing that the, the Lord will do um, for the body of Christ, for the bride of Christ. Uh, it's a millisecond in time experience, an event that will happen faster than you can blink and we will be caught up into the presence of the Lord. That's when we receive our eternal resurrection bodies. These will be bodies that, were, that will be designed to live forever. You know, right now, these bodies, they get old, they wear out, you know, they get, you know, sick and have ailments and eventually die. But our new resurrection bodies will never grow old, will never get sick, will never have any disease, will never get tired, and there'll be no death. Now... We will also see this as an event that will only happen to a very select group of people. Um, you got to be careful when you say that today. They think, oh, you're a white supremacist. No, <laughs> that's not what it refers to at all. A very select group of people. The, this select group of people have, are, is made up of men, women, boys, girls from every tribe, every tongue, every color, every nation in the world who have given their lives to Jesus Christ, from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich. But it's only a narrow uh, club, you might say, because it will be only those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. You have to be born again 
to be part of the body of Christ. You must be born again, a follower of Jesus. After all, the rapture is simply the moment when the bridegroom, that's Jesus, comes for his bride, you and me, the church. This is what the, the whole event is about. Jesus coming from heaven. He will descend from heaven. We'll see in a moment. <clears throat> and he will call us, the bride of Christ, to come to be with him. And we will spend the next seven years in heaven with him before he comes back to planet Earth. Now, listen to this promise that Jesus gives to those who are saved. This is uh, John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then the all-important question, do you believe this? Uh, again, I've said for many years, this is the most amazing, radical, you know, greatest statement any human being has ever made. And if anybody made this besides Jesus, you would rightly say, the person that says, believe in me and you'll never die, they're an idiot. They'd be a fool. Because if Jesus is, you know, not saying this, if somebody else said it, you would rightly say, no, that guy's nuts. But because Jesus Christ is the one that says this, believe in me and you'll never die, you'll live forever, that is something that we can hold fast to. That is the greatest promise of all time. Because according to the Bible, those of us who believe in Christ alone for our salvation, we will not experience death. That's a radical statement. You will never die. In Christian terminology, that means we will never experience separation from God. Because for a Christian, that's all death is, a separation from God. But we have the promise that we'll never be separated from the Lord. Remember that before we got saved, we were already dead to God. Uh, it tells us in Ephesians 2, verse 1, you were dead. He made you alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. So before we got saved, we were as dead as you could be, separated from God. But when Jesus came into our lives, the Holy Spirit caused us to become born again or spiritually alive to God. And it's because we are spiritually alive to God that we will never be separated from Him. In other words, when a Christian dies physically, that person's spirit immediately goes into the presence of the Lord. So the hope we have in Jesus is not just for a few more years here on planet Earth, but our hope is for an eternity in glory where we will dwell with Jesus Christ forever and ever in our new resurrection bodies. And oh, how glorious that will be when we stand in his presence and we are like him, John the Apostle says. When we see him, we will be like him. That's, that's a mind blower. But again, that's something that will only happen to those who have repented of their sins and they've turned to Christ for salvation. Now, as much as we might desire to live on earth for as long as possible, a day will come when we will all stand at the threshold of eternity. But the big question is, where are you going to stand? Where are you going to go when you stand before God? Is he going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord? Or is he going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I've never known you. Now the Bible only gives us two choices. If we turn to Christ, we'll spend eternity with him. But if a person rejects God's love, they reject God's forgiveness, that, you know, his forgiveness that's found only in Christ, that person will spend eternity in the lake of fire. The amazing thing is God has left that decision up to you. Where are you going to spend eternity? He's not going to force you to go to heaven. He's not going to force you to go to hell. You have a choice. You're going to receive him and be forgiven, or you're going to reject him, and, and you'll be rejected by him eventually. Satan is the one who came to steal, kill, and destroy, and he'll do everything in his power to keep people from knowing the truth about Christ. And the truth is Jesus loves us. The truth is he came into this sin-filled world 2,000 years ago because he wanted to set captives free. He wanted to heal broken hearts. He wanted to save lost souls. And he made all that possible by taking the pain, the punishment, and the penalty of our sins upon himself when he hung on the cross. That's his whole purpose for coming 2,000 years ago. He had to shed his blood. That's the only acceptable sacrifice for our sins. So he died in our place. 
He was buried in the tomb, and that third morning, early in that third morning, he rose from the grave, and then for the next 40 days, he appeared to the disciples, and he proved he's alive, risen from the dead, and they were blown away. And after he told them to wait in Jerusalem for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he ascended up into the heavens, and they watched as he just slowly ascended up into heaven. And this is what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, while he is uh, going up and they're standing there, and they, he just disappears. And then this is what we read. These two angels are standing there next to the disciples, and they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, you saw him visibly go up in heaven. He's going to come back physically as well, visibly, literally. He's coming back. And so at first, he's coming back for his bride, the church, those of us who belong to him. Jesus gives us a very powerful picture of this in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Look at these verses starting in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. This is a parable about these ten virgins, but notice what happens in this scene. And this speaks of him coming for his bride. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet their, the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Oh, rumbling. <laughs> Maybe the trumpet will sound next. <laughs> those, okay, verse 3, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. In the scriptures, the oil represents the Holy Spirit, and so five virgins did not have the Holy Spirit. They were make-believers. They're not genuine believers, but these five virgins that have the oil, they are true believers. Amen. Amen. Verse 5, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So all of them, you know, the Lord has, in, in a sense, delayed his coming for 2,000 years. Um, the wicked servant says, oh, my Lord delays his coming, so I'm going to just eat, drink, and be merry, do my own thing. That's not what he's referring to. It's just there's a long time, you know, you're going through life. They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. I think we're getting very, very close to midnight in God's clock. I don't know what his time frame is, but if, the, you know, if midnight, according to the scriptures, is when he's coming for his bride, we're getting very close to that time. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. That's the same thing he says in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, when <clears throat> there'll be those that come before Jesus and said, Hey, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name, perform many signs and wonders in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And he'll say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Same thing he says here. Verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And, and we do not know the day or the hour when the rapture takes place. Nobody does. Anybody that sets a date. I remember years ago, you know, we moved here in 85, and then there's a book that came out shortly, 88 Reasons Why 1988, the rapture's going to happen. Well, they proved themselves to be false prophets. Didn't happen. It, it, you can't set a date because nobody knows except for the Lord. And so the verses we have before us here in 1 Thessalonians 13 through 18 tell us how Jesus comes for his bride, his church, his followers. Just like Jesus called the bridegroom to come. They were ready. They were watching. 
So let's take a look at the rapture of the bride of Christ. Verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So notice that Paul says here that he doesn't want them or us to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. What does that phrase, fallen asleep, refer to? It means to be dead. And we'll see why in a moment. I mean, you remember when Jesus, um, he and the disciples were down at the Jordan River, and Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, was very sick. And so they send word to go get Jesus. He was down at the Jordan. They were up in the little town of Bethany near the Mount of Olives. And so they send you know, messengers down there, and it says, Jesus waited two more days before you know, heading back up there. And the disciples, you know, are thinking, well, okay, I guess he's not so sick. And Jesus tells them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, so let's go and wake him up. And so the disciples think, oh, if he's asleep, he'll get well, he'll get better. And then Jesus said, no, Lazarus is dead. So when it talks about sleep in the New Testament, it means you're physically dead. That's the point. When an unsaved person dies, there's no rest, there's no peace, there's no comfort. But when a believer dies and it says they rest or they sleep, that's what it refers to. They're resting, they're in comfort, they're at peace with the Lord. But for an unbeliever, even though the physical body gives out and dies, the person's spirit lives on, the soul lives on. For the unbeliever, they go to a place of torment, called Hades, and Jesus talks about this in Luke 16, where there's the, the poor man, the beggar, Lazarus, a different Lazarus, and he dies and goes to Abraham's bosom. And then the rich man, he died without the Lord, and he goes to the place of torment. There says, it says there's this chasm between Abraham's bosom, which was paradise. Remember the thief on the cross, Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. That was Abraham's bosom. It says Jesus led captivity captive. After he died, was buried, he went there and set all those free who were in the paradise side. So paradise now is in glory with the Lord. The place of torment of Hades is still there. That's a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. So for us as Christians, when we die physically, our spirit and soul immediately goes into the presence of the Lord in other words, look at death for us as simply moving day. You move out of this body and you move into the presence of the Lord. We're going to enter into the glory of heaven. And so Paul is telling us that we don't need to sorrow, he says, as the unsaved. Because the unsaved, they sorrow because they have no hope. And he says, you don't need to sorrow as if you have no hope, because our hope is in Christ. Our hope is a blessed hope, a living hope. Look at these verses, Titus 2.13. Paul says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at this one, 1 Peter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Why do we have a living hope? Because it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we don't have an empty, dead hope. I hope there's a heaven, but I'm not sure. I hope I make it. No, we have a glorious living hope. Is it God? No? Okay. <laughs> I'll take, take that call. <laughs> so we have a living hope because Jesus is alive. If, if he died and stayed dead and buried and didn't rise up on the third day, then we would have no hope. We'd be like the world. There's, this is the end. We turn to worm food, I guess. That's all there is. But no, Jesus gives us living hope. John 14 Verses 1 through 3, this is Jesus telling us that when we, he comes for us, he's preparing a place for us. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. That's what he's doing now. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. 
He's preparing a place. He's coming for us. This is a reference to the rapture, the bridegroom coming for his bride. He's coming from heaven to our atmospheres, we'll see in a moment. Now, there are some groups out there that believe that these references to death as being asleep means that when a Christian dies, we go into this state of soul sleep or state of unconsciousness. That's when you stay in that condition until Jesus wakes you up at the end and, you know, when the resurrection happens. <laughs> this is awesome. We need the rain. Thank you, Lord. So, I do not believe in soul sleep for a couple of important reasons. Um, that would not be very hopeful to think, okay, I'm, I'm going to die now, and then I just you know, go to sleep and don't even have any consciousness of God or anything until way down the road when he raises us up. That's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And so we will not be separated from the Lord even when we physically die. Paul confirms this. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Paul says, We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. To be absent from this body at death, physical death, is to be present with the Lord. There's no sleeping in that. You go to be with Jesus. Paul says this in Philippians 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, in this body, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So to die and depart and be with Jesus is infinitely better than hanging around this sinful world. And so Paul says, I'm caught between the two. I have that desire to go home to be with Jesus. But as long as he keeps me here, I'm going to keep serving him. I'm going to keep working, keep serving the Father. I'm going to occupy until Christ comes. So it's far better, more glorious to leave this wicked world behind and go home to be with Jesus in heaven. I know some of you are, are ready right now. You know, you're like, man, I wish the rapture would happen tonight. I wish you were right, Jeff, to Wednesday night, the rapture. <laughs> so that's why Paul tells the Thessalonians, we don't sorrow like unbelievers who die without any hope of eternal life because we will always be with Jesus. After all, Jesus is the one who says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm with you always, even to the end of this age. And so that includes going from this life into the next. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't leave us sleeping. He brings us into his presence. This is why I often tell people when I do funerals, I remind them, hey, when you take your last breath here on earth, you're going to take your first breath in the presence of God in glory. So keep that in mind. Now, how do people obtain this blessed, eternal hope of going to heaven when we die on earth? In other words, how do you get this one-way ticket to paradise? How do you get this one-way ticket to glory? Look at verse 14. I'm hearing some feedback. <laughs> For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep, those who have died in Jesus. Now, this is important because notice, first of all, the promise of eternal life is only for those who have put their hope in Jesus. They believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is Paul's very abbreviated gospel. Jesus died and he rose again. That's the gospel. He died for our sins, buried in the tomb, rose from the dead. Can you guys hear me? 
Yeah? I can't even hear myself. This is weird. This is pretty awesome, though. We don't get rain for 18 months like Elijah calling down rain from heaven. It's awesome. Anyway, this is his very abbreviated definition of the gospel of Christ that saves a person from going to hell. You have to believe that Jesus died on the cross. You have to believe that he shed his blood for you. You have to believe that he rose up from the dead. That's what the gospel is. So by believing in Christ, you're acknowledging that he alone paid the price for your sins. He alone shed his blood for the sins of the world. He alone satisfied God's judgment against your sin. To believe in Jesus, it also implies that you are surrendering your life to him. The word believe, it's not just some passive word like, oh, I believe in Jesus. Like, oh, I believe in Abraham Lincoln. I believe he was our 16th president. I believe he, you know, wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. I believe he was assassinated by, you know, Booth. So I believe it. That doesn't do anything for you. That's just a head knowledge about facts. To say the same thing of Jesus won't do anything good for you either. Because I know a lot of people say, well, I believe Jesus is a historical person. I believe Jesus came to earth, was born of a virgin. I mean, my mom, before she got saved, she could quote the Apostles' Creed like nobody's business. After I got saved, I didn't even know the Apostles' Creed, but she knew it, but she didn't know Jesus. And so to believe in him implies an active step of faith. You're putting your faith, your trust in Christ alone. John chapter 1, verse 12. I feel like I need to do sign language or something while I'm giving these scriptures. I wish I knew sign language. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. That means, again, put your trust in Christ. Put your faith in him alone. Colossians chapter, uh, first, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. This is Paul's gospel message. Here in verse 14, he gives us just, you know, Jesus died, rose again. Well, here's the whole gospel that Paul gives us. Starting in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received... So he received this from the Lord, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have, noticed fallen asleep. Again, some have died in Christ. So if you believe the gospel, if you've received Jesus into your life by faith, even so, Paul says at the end of verse 14 here, God will bring with him those who sleep or who have died in Jesus. In other words, all true believers who have died in Christ are presently, right now, in the presence of Jesus. That's a fact. Because people ask me all the time, so my brother, you know, or my sister in the Lord, they just died. Where are they? They're in the presence of the Lord. If they're a believer, they're not just, their body's in the ground, but spirit is up in the presence of God. So Paul tells us, we don't have to sorrow for those who died in Christ. In fact, they're not going to miss out on anything when Jesus returns at the rapture. In fact, those who died in Christ will have a very slight advantage over us who are still alive when Jesus comes for his bride. Look at verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So this is Paul speaking. The word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, we are not at an advantage at the time of the rapture 
And Christians who have died are not at a disadvantage at the time of the rapture either. Notice as we go through these verses, Paul uses the word we. When he says, we who are alive remain. This is known as the eminent return of Christ or the eminency of Christ's return. That simply means that Jesus could come back at any moment. That's what eminency means. He could rapture the church at any time. The apostles taught this. They believed this. The early church fathers, many of them taught this. They believed this. Many Christians down through the ages have taught this and believed this. And why wouldn't we believe this? Why wouldn't I teach this? After all, it was Jesus who said this, Matthew 24, verse 42. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Again, Matthew 25, verse 13, Jesus says, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so the belief that Jesus could come at any moment, that's nothing new. You know, Jesus could come. That's been taught, believed throughout the ages. Some of you have heard of Irenaeus. Irenaeus was the disciple of Polycarp. Heard the name Polycarp? He was a disciple of the Apostle John. Irenaeus taught that Christ could come at any moment for his bride, for the church. Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage, he taught a pre-tribulation rapture in the 200s. A man by the name of Ephraim, the Syrian, in the 300s taught a pre-tribulation rapture. Many throughout church history have believed this. Now this is what's going to happen. This is what the rapture looks like. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. One of the beautiful facts of the rapture is Jesus Christ himself is personally coming for his bride. He's not sending an angel. You know, he's not sending some special messenger. Jesus himself is going to descend from heaven. Remember, he's coming for the bride. He's coming from heaven Back in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, Paul was commending the Thessalonians because they turned away from idols and they were serving the true and living God and they were waiting for Jesus who was going to deliver them from the wrath to come. Well, we'll look at the wrath of God, Lord willing, next week in chapter 5. But realize this, one of the details, or one of the reasons, I should say, for the rapture is so that Jesus removes his bride before the great tribulation. It's before the 70th week of Daniel. Before that seven-year period where God pours out his wrath, his condemnation upon a Christ-rejecting world. That's the purpose of the rapture, is to take us out of here. And once we're out of here, then he's going to deal with Israel once again. This is why it's called the 70th week of Daniel, seven-year period that's dealing with the Jewish people once again. During that seven-year period, Satan's restraints are removed. He is going to go crazy. Demons are going to be let loose all over the world. The only ones who are not affected by the demons and by God's wrath are the 144,000 Jews who will be sealed with the mark of God, Revelation 7 and 14, and they're going to witness for the Lord throughout the seven-year tribulation period. The church is going to be gone. Now, it's also the time during the great tribulation when the battle of Armageddon takes place. You can read about that in Revelation 16. This is when all the nations will gather there in the valley of Megiddo. We go there every time we go to Israel. It's an amazing battlefield. That's going to be where this takes place. All these nations are going to be demonically induced and brought in there. and They're going to be fighting. This whole world is going to be on the brink of annihilation. And it's only at the second coming of Christ that he bring an end to the great tribulation. I don't know if you saw this week, they were talking about Russia's new uh, stealth fighter jets that they've just developed. They just finished a few months ago a new missile system 
The name of it cracks me up because it's called, you can Google it, it's called Satan 2. Satan 2. It looks like a giant missile like you'd send up astronauts in, and that's how big it is. It, it holds up to 15 nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads. And Putin boasts that this thing is indefensible. This thing cannot be stopped. Well, if they try to bring it against Israel in Ezekiel 38, 39 war, God will stop it. The Iron Dome of God's Iron Dome will stop it. But the fact is, this time frame is known as the Great Tribulation. This is what Jesus says of this time frame. Look at these verses, Matthew 24, uh, starting in verse 21. This is after the abomination of desolation, which is when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple. Worship me, I'm God, he says. And then Jesus says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world, until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And the elect that Jesus is referring to are the Jewish people. They're the ones he is going to protect a remnant of Jews during the great tribulation. Again, the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another name for Israel, the time of Israel's trouble. It's the 70th week of Daniel. The only reason this world is not totally destroyed during the Great Tribulation is because Jesus shortens those days. Unless those days are short, no flesh should be saved. He shortens those days by coming back and destroying the Antichrist, throwing him and the false prophet in the lake of fire, locking Satan away for a thousand years, and he's just going to bring an end to the chaos and the murder, and then he's going to set up his kingdom that will last for 1,000 years. We'll look more at that next time. But again, notice as it says here in verse 16, when Jesus comes for us, he comes with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. So what's the shout? I have no idea. It could be, you know, what he says in Revelation chapter 4 to John the Apostle, come up here. I might, that's all he has to say, come up here. And then, boom, we're up in his presence. And it could be like he did with Lazarus at the tomb of Lazarus. Church or bride, come forth. Remember, Lazarus, come forth. We don't know what his voice is going to be, what it's going to say, but he's going to catch us up. The voice of the, or the, yeah, the voice of the archangel? What does that sound like? Who knows? There's only one archangel mentioned by name, and that's uh, Michael the archangel. He's powerful. I'm sure if he shouts something, it's going to be loud. It's going to be powerful. The trumpet of God that's mentioned here, he, Paul will mention this also in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll look at this in a moment. It's called the last trumpet. And, and so Paul's ref, uh, referring to the Romans, and they would blast three trumpets. The first trumpet, when the Romans would blast this around their soldiers, it would strike the tent, prepare to move. The second trumpet would, strike, uh, would blow, and it meant fall in line. The third trumpet meant move ahead, or move out, march away. Well, that's the last trumpet that Paul describes and we'll see that here in a moment. So the shout, voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, it's time to go up into the presence of the Lord. Notice at the end of verse 16, Paul says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now again, look at verse 14, where he says the Lord will bring with him those who died in Christ. But here we see the dead in Christ rise first. So what's going on here? Again, when a Christian dies physically, their body goes into the grave, but their spirit goes to be with Jesus. It's at the rapture that the dead saints receive their resurrection bodies. So the dead in Christ rise first. Their physical bodies will be put back together, resurrection body, as Jesus comes with their spirit from heaven. That's when they're given their resurrection body. That happens in a split second. But then something truly amazing happens in a millisecond after that. Look at verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain, we, so Paul said, this could happen in my lifetime. You know, nobody knows the day or the hour. So we who are alive and remain, and so 
as a pastor right now saying this, I'm including myself. We who are alive and remain, this could happen in any moment. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. And so again, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. One of the knocks people have on the rapture is, oh, the rapture is never mentioned in the Bible. You ever heard that? The word rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. In fact, in fact, I'll get there. <laughs> Hang in there, Joshua. So, in fact, the word Bible is not mentioned in the Bible. The word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. But the concepts are certainly taught. The thing is, the word caught up, he says, we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds. The Greek word is harpazo. The Latin word for harpazo is rapturus. That's where we get the English word for rapture. So it doesn't matter what you call it because the word simply means to be snatched away. It means to be taken away. It means to be taken by force. Here he says you're caught up. We see that word used numbers of times in the New Testament. Remember when Philip was out in the wilderness and he's uh, baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch? It says when he came up out of the water with the Ethiopian eunuch, it says that Philip was caught away and he was found 40 miles away. The word is harpazo. He was caught away. Instantly he was transformed, moved somewhere else. That's a great way to travel. I, I'm not looking forward to having a you know, electric car, you know, I don't know, doesn't matter to me. We're going to be traveling hyperspeed at some point. It's going to be glorious. But notice where we're taken. He says, we are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is the rapture. We go from earth up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then we go into heaven. This is what distinguishes the rapture from the second coming. At the second coming, we come back from heaven with Jesus to the earth. Another distinction, when the rapture takes place, it's going to be basically business as usual. The world's going to be going through normal things, whatever normal looks like these days, but the rapture could happen and we're gone. When we come back at the second coming, when Christ returns, this world's on the brink of annihilation because of the great tribulation, because of God's wrath poured out, Every sea creature is dead. Every fresh water supply is poisoned. Every tree is burned up. You think we got problems now with fires? During the Great Tribulation, it's on the brink, again, of annihilation. But Jesus comes back in the nick of time, and then he's going to make this like a Garden of Eden kind of a place once again. So there's, very, there, there's a lot of sharp contrast between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. They're very distinct. Look at these verses. This is the parallel passage that Paul gives us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, where are we starting at? Verse 51. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, again, die, but we shall all be changed. How fast? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and here it is at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That's the dead in Christ, raised first, and we shall be changed. Again, those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. For this corruptible, that's our physical bodies, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. This is for all of us today in the world in which we're living. Immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor 
in the Lord is not in vain, or your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I mean, God wants us to continue to fight the good fight, to stay on course. And so with an event like this that is so dramatic, so glorious, that could happen at any moment, you want to make sure that when the trumpet sounds, you're going to be caught up together with all the saints and meet Jesus in the air. Because again, soon after we're out of here, the clock will start for the Jews when they sign the peace treaty with the Antichrist. And then the seven years of great tribulation will begin. So you don't want to be left behind. you got to come to Christ. For all of us who are still here, living for the Lord, look at these verses. I'm going to close here. Romans 13, starting in verse 11. Hopefully this is a good exhortation for all of us. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. I mean, we have God's word on it. He's coming back for his bride. Before the worship team comes up, let me throw this out there. Any questions about the rapture? That's a daring thing to ask, isn't it? <laughs> Any, you know, anybody have a question? Come on. Yes. The unbelievers? Yeah, we have no idea what the unbelievers will think at that moment. I mean, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me. So the world doesn't know the voice of Jesus. And so even with the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the world might think, oh, it was thunder. Uh, according to a, if anybody read the um, Daily Sentinel editorials yesterday, um, after reading what this one gal was saying about evangelicals, how we need to be taken out of here so that, you know, if COVID takes us out, that's a good thing. So that's kind of weird to say that, but I'm thinking, well, that'll be a good explanation. The rapture happens. Oh, they were anti-vaxxers. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what the world's going to say? Aliens. That's another thing. Uh, Dave Hunt wrote a great book called The Archon Conspiracy many years ago, and, and it was, it was a, a novel. Um, and it was really good just because it was talking about that whole scenario where so many people think, oh, we're going to be abducted, we're going to be taken out of here, and, and the New Agers believe that this world, that Mother Earth, must purge herself of all these people that they disagree with, which would be primarily Christians. So the, the world's going to think this is a good thing for us to be gone. I'm going to think it's going to be a great thing for us to be gone. And, and yet I've, I don't feel like it's going to be a good thing for those who are left behind. That's why we need to be about the Father's business. So it's a good question, though, Kathy, because I don't know. I think they'll have some excuse for what happened. They'll try to explain it. I mean... You know, we've seen the scenarios, if you watch any of the, you know, Left Behind series and different things, you know, Christians are flying jet airliners. All of a sudden they get raptured. Nobody's in the cockpit. I mean, it's going to be chaos at that moment around the world. And so the Antichrist, that's when he's revealed after the church is gone. That's in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 and 8. Once the restrainer, the Holy Spirit-filled church, is removed, then it says the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. And that's when he's going to try to make everything wonderful and right, and people are going to think, oh, this guy so much better than Joe Biden. <laughs> They're going to think he's great. Anyway, any other questions? Jeff, is it true that uh, the airlines always have a Christian in one of the two <laughs> I've heard that, but who knows anymore? I doubt they, you know, you, yeah, Jerry asked if, the, if it's true, airlines would always have a Christian pilot. 
Um, I kind of doubt that'll happen. The further we get into this, it seems like more and more Christians are getting isolated out of things. So I don't know. I haven't heard that. Anybody else hear that? Any pilots here? Know anything about that? Yes. <laughs> Twenty-five, yeah. How do you explain the ones that they? It says that they were running out of oil. Mm. So, no, I just said they had no oil in their lamps. But further down, does it not say? They were running? No. no. They, yeah, I have to reread that. The lamps were going out. Those foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil with them. Um, then all the virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. So, so lip, but they didn't have any oil. So you try to light an oil lamp without oil, you can get it to smolder a little bit. Maybe I don't know if that's the reference, that it's just like a little puff of smoke going up. I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, though, because it starts off saying they took no oil with them, unless they had just a little, I don't know. Yep. That Yeah. Well, it kind of ties in with Matthew 7, where he talks about those who will say, you know, Lord, Lord, didn't we, you know, do all these signs and wonders? They look like Christians. They act like Christians. But he says the same thing to the five virgins and then also the others. Depart from me. I never knew you. Well, maybe it was just their wits that were burning. Maybe. That's a good question. Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. That's uh, Yeah, I didn't think of that, but that's a good one to look into. And um, one of those questions, you file away later for Jesus. <laughs> and then we'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah, Steve, keep it simple. What are you saying? I can't hear you. Yeah. No, I think you should rent the movie. It's a great movie. Yeah, it's about the Galilee wedding and just the different things about the Galilee wedding. It's it's a different service than a normal wedding in Jerusalem, and it's called Before the Wrath. It's a great um, kind of documentary, I guess, and things that they've uncovered recently about the Galilean wedding experience and that the, the bride would be carried away and, and taken to her future husband. The father would tell, you know, his son, go fetch your bride, and then she would be carried out to the husband. And so that's like us being carried up into the presence of the Lord. So, yeah. Yep. The rapture comes first. So once, yeah, so the question was what comes first, the mark of the beast or the rapture? And so the rapture comes first, and, and that's what it says. In, if you want to look there real quick, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains, this is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So the, the he is referring to the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit's in the church, and so once the church is taken out of the way, it's the very next verse is, And then the lawless one, that's reference to the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And, and so, yeah, the rapture takes place, the Antichrist will be revealed, He'll begin, the first thing he does is he makes his peace treaty with the Jewish people. It's in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and that allows them to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. And I believe they're going to build it where that little gazebo is called the Dome of the Tablets, Dome of the Spirit. And 
it's not going to be a permanent temple. It's just going to be for the Antichrist, because when Jesus returns, he comes to the Mount of Olives, it splits in two, he goes through the eastern gate that the Muslims have uh, walled up with cement, he'll go through that, because you can't stop Jesus. You know, he's going to go right through there, and then he's going to begin to rule and reign. But then when you look at the millennial temple spoken of in uh, Ezekiel 40 through 45, it takes up the whole temple. The whole temple mount is going to be reconfigured. I mean, that whole geological landscape is going to be totally different when Christ returns. You know, the Mount of Olives splits. Water is going to flow all the way down to the Dead Sea from that area. And the Dead Sea is going to come back to life. There's going to be fishing along that river. And then the, the temple that's going to be there for uh, the millennial reign, thousand years, it's going to be, I don't know, it's like 10 times bigger than Solomon's temple. It's going to be amazing. Just the, the dimensions that are given. That's the temple Jesus will rule and reign from. So the Antichrist will build a temple, or, or the Jews will build a temple because the Antichrist will give them the go-ahead. And it says three and a half years into, after they get the temple built, three and a half years later, that's when the Antichrist goes into the temple and says, Worship me, I'm God. And that's called the abomination of desolation. Jesus says in Matthew 24, Verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand, and he tells the Jews, get out of Jerusalem, flee, run. Don't even get your coat. Just get out of there because that's when the great tribulation gets even worse, the final three and a half years. Um, Paul says of that, uh, the very next verse, verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians 2, The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And, and so it's just going to be a, a horrible, brutal time, as so many people are going to be deceived, thinking the Antichrist is the Messiah. I mean, the first, it's interesting because the first time, I don't know if you saw this, Jody and Craig, when you were in Israel years ago, I don't know when you first went, but it was like 20 years, 25 years ago, uh, there's banners all over Israel. Messiah is coming. And I was asking, um, well, Amir was our guide at that time, Amir Sarfati. And he said, what is that? Because it's all in Hebrew. It says, Messiah is coming. I was like, which Messiah? And he goes, exactly. They're, they're saying the Messiah is whoever brings peace to Israel. That is our Messiah. Well, that's what the Antichrist is going to do. And so they're going to be deceived. According to Zechariah chapter 13, two-thirds of all the Jews during the Great Tribulation are going to be put to death by the Antichrist. It's going to be another holocaust. So one-third will be the, be the ones that escape out into the wilderness where Jesus protects them for the final three and a half years. When Christ returns and we come back with Him, every single Jew, according to Romans eleven twenty five, will be saved. They'll see Him. They'll recognize Him. Zechariah twelve ten says they'll mourn for Him as a mother mourns for her only son. And they're going to ask Jesus, where did you get those wounds in your hand? He says, in the house of my friends. And they're going to receive Christ once and for all as their Messiah. So it's going to be a, a glorious day. But in the meantime, again, the Great Tribulation is going to be brutal. So that's a long way to answer your question there. <laughs> so, yeah, rapture comes first. So that's the next thing, really, on any kind of, um, you know, event as far as prophecy is concerned. It's just... When Israel became a nation in you know, May 14th, 1948, that was very, very significant because there's scriptures that talk about God's going to bring the Jews back into the land in the last days. And he's done it. And when you see the fig tree blossoming forth, that's referring to Israel in the last days, blossoming forth. I mean, they're an amazing little country. And Jerusalem's going to be the cup of trembling for the whole world. Why does the whole world hate Jerusalem, Israel, the Jews? It's crazy. We got people in our Congress, AOC and the rest of the squad, that hate the Jews. What is that? Well, it's demonic. There's no rational reason. Jews make up like one-tenth of one percent of the population. Very small, almost insignificant, you might say. And yet, they're the apple of God's eye. He's not done with the Jews. They're not saved right now, most of them. Amir is, obviously, and those who come to Christ. He's the only way of salvation. 
Anyway, any other questions? Anything else I can butcher? I do this in India with the pastors and the church planners, and man, we'll be here for like two hours. It's like, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs>